Welcome back to the warm room. Our next topic is improvised explosive devices. Now for gentlemen like uh, Jim Murphy, uh, we used to refer to them as booby traps. And booby trapping was a, a very common experience in the, the Second World War by both sides. And we certainly experienced it again in Korea. There's probably few, few operations that sappers practice that have changed as much as booby trapping or improvised devices, improvised devices have uh, over the years. Back in the 60s, some will remember the, uh, the Dukabor uh, demonstrations and the, the bombings that went on out in BC and Western Canada. Then in the 70s, we encountered the violence of the FLQ. As those new uses of IEDs were introduced, the Canadian Forces organization changed on how to deal with them, our responsibilities and a, a greater responsibility taken on by the, uh, the Ordnance Corps and by uh, EOD centers across the country working with the police agencies. We had to evolve, we constantly evolved to meet the changing operational situation. The operational situation changed even much more rapidly when we saw what was going on in the Balkans and certainly of late in the Middle East. The Canadian military engineers, the, the research and the business uh, commercial communities that have backed us up have done wonders in terms of providing the Canadian forces with a very significant counter IED capability. Tonight we can share some of the first hand experiences with, uh, with IEDs. It's a pleasure to introduce Sergeant Quinnell, currently in Fort Troop with 24 Field Squadron in 2 Combat Engineer Regiment, and he'll speak to us this evening of his personal experiences in Afghanistan from April to December 2010. Welcome. Evening. As mentioned, I'm Sergeant Jeff Canal from uh, 2 Combat Engineer Regiment in Petawawa. So, from the period of April to December 2010, I was employed as a counter IED operator within one of the teams as part of Task Force 110. So we had five teams deployed in theater. Every team had two counter IED operators. And this is the team itself. I was part of this team, EOD-4. Uh, on the far left, we have Warrant Officer Mike Miller. He's an RCR. He was the, the tactical exploitation technician. So responsible for amalgamating the atmospherics surrounding the, the IED incident. Uh, to his left, uh, myself, I'm one of the operators. In the middle, Master Corporal Daryl Jansen. He was the electronic countermeasures technician. Second from the right, it would be the driver, uh, Master Corporal Chris Parmelo, responsible for the overall operation of the vehicle, ensuring it was good to go at all times. And to the far right is the other operator, Sergeant Ian Kennedy. So this team, uh, EOD-4, we responded to approximately 75 calls. 75 calls comprising either a find, being somebody may have found an IED, potentially. Maybe a cache find, so they found a lot, of, uh, a lot of components that would comprise an IED. As mentioned, IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device. Or, or it could be a post-blast scenario, where the, unfortunately the IED went off, but there's still a lot of forensics to gather. So in terms of why I'm here, I was asked to come and speak to my experiences from that time mentioned. 75 calls, approximately 100 IEDs. Probably can't sum that up in half an hour. Not going to happen. But what I would like to speak to is the why. The why of the job. When I returned from overseas, I operated, uh, excuse me, operating in that role, my wife asked me why. Why did you want to do the job? 
I didn't know. I could fluff it off and say it was it was rewarding, okay? Or I could say uh, it was interesting, chance to serve my country. Right, right. Not good enough for the one. Why did you do that? Why did you want to get employed to that capacity? So I had to ask myself why. I never did that before. I just did it. But one of the words I kept coming back to was fun. I always said it was fun. Well, I did it because it was fun. I had fun doing it. That's why I did it. Not good enough for anyone else. <laughs> why was it fun? So it's to that effect that I'm going to attempt to speak to you tonight. The why. Why was it fun? So I did a bit of a bit of research within myself, and I came up to uh, I it's five primary reasons. So next slide, please. There's the inside of the vehicle. Touch on the Y, excellent. No, uh, no big issues there. That's just a console. We used to operate the ROV, remotely operated vehicle. It's all good. Next slide. Here's what I came up with. The mentality psychology. So it's fun. What made it fun? Well, the attitude of approach made it fun. It doesn't matter what it is you're doing. If you have a positive attitude of approach, it will affect the outcome, right? This is, has been shown again and again and again throughout history. So I'm a pretty positive individual. Doesn't matter what I'm doing, I'm usually having fun doing it. I found that to be one of the contributing factors. The other was the risk. The associated risk with the job made it fun. That might seem insane to some of you, I understand that, but it temporarily heightened life. The same way as skydiving or bungee, jump, or bungee jumping would. Luck, it's a lot of fun being lucky. <laughs> That's it. Faith, I don't mean faith in terms of having faith in a superior being or in God above. I mean faith in each other. Within that team, we had 100% faith at all times that that individual beside you was looking out for your best interests. And you know what? You're doing the same thing. We're five members and it was great. And the intellectual stimulation. As previously mentioned, there's a lot of atmospherics that go around an IED, right? There's a lot of either financial contributions, resource availability, time. How much time did that person commit to putting that thing in there? Uh, target. What type of uh, device it is. All that stuff actually is really intriguing to me. So that intellectual stimulation was there at every single call. Sometimes not enough, sometimes too much. So, getting into two specific calls. I narrowed it down to two. Two out of the approximate 100 IDs. These two I found to come back and back again, just hitting all five points and just being fun. And you're going to see why in a minute. Next slide. So this particular IED, just to understand about uh, what's going on here, is this taking place, as it says right here on the top right, PBSG approximately 250 meters northwest, so patrol base for Wunga. This is a fortified position in, uh, in Kandahar province in Afghanistan. This is ideal location in the center of your picture. That's where it is. It's in the tree. So what had happened was there was a patrol returning, this mounted patrol returning to PBSG from a KLE, or key leader in the Now the language assistant uh, said, hey, I noticed something suspicious in that tree. No problem. They called Force, uh, Force, sorry, the Integral Engineer Assets. They said, let me have a look at it. Looked up, yeah, it might be something, might not, who knows. Then one of the engineers said, I think I see a Y. Okay, good enough. They shot up a report, called in the OD Assets. Here we are. Now you can tell by the roads that we can't get our vehicle in there. So it's dismounted. Dismounted means you're walking in. That's all it means, you're parking your vehicle away, you're walking in, whatever tools you carry in, those are the tools you got. All right. So we show up. So DOT, the blue arrow, direction of travel. That's the direction of travel of the patrol. ICP in the title, view of the, from the ICP, incident control point. That's where we are. So that's where we gather to the site. We're saying, okay, what's going on here, folks? So there's a lot going on right here. In my mind, what I'm trying to do, so atmospherics in the situation in terms of intellectual stimulation, I'm trying to decide what type of IED this may be. What's going on here? So there's various different, well, there's various types of IEDs. I'm trying to think, why would somebody put it here? And how would it function? That's what I'm thinking, right? 
It's this thing called threat assessment. We're assessing the situation. We're doing so as a team. But what do you think? What do you think? Well, it could be this, yeah, it could be that. We're doing so quickly, very quickly. All right, next slide, please. Now, that's a view south, uh, looking back at the ICP. Uh, not much more information to, uh, to gather from this, although if you look at the blue arrow on the right-hand side of the picture, there's a hole in the wall. That will come into play later on. Next slide. Uh, simply a view looking east. So from that threat assessment, what we had determined was it's probably, if it was an ID, it was probably RC, remotely controlled or remote control ID. So if you look around, you see grape pots in the uh, distance. You see a bunch of trees, bushes. All these are, are a bunch of grape pots. They're about maybe this deep. Excellent hiding spots for a trigger man. All of it. So now we have to start thinking, why hasn't this device functioned yet? Why hasn't it gone off? There was a patrol right under that tree walking right by. How come the trigger man didn't set it off? How come he didn't do it? What's going on here? Who's the target? Right? Uh, next slide. So what's particular about this slide, you'll see it's going to come into play. There's the ideal location. Remember I said it's 250 meters away from a fortified position, right? Next slide. There's a the position there. So hey, what are you actually seeing from this position? Are you seeing something in a tree like a Claymore type of device? Or right, not there yet. Okay. We're about to walk up on it, taking you in. <laughs> so these... These guys aren't amateurs, right? They're not amateurs. This is a couple steps beside. You see the ID location there. All they had to do is use the cover of darkness and walk right behind that tree. It doesn't matter what type of optics we had to observe. We didn't see it. It's not amateurs. They know what they're doing. All right, next slide. Here we go. Getting into it. So what we gathered and what uh, Warren Officer Mike Miller was able to tell me uh, via PRR or personal radio is that this hole right here was conducted or was, was imposed on the wall, if you will, by a previous reconnaissance patrol. So the insurgents realized, hey, they're probably going to use that hole again, human beings being lazy, and put the ID up there, right? That's why they did it. So next time you see them walking through the hole, we got them. So again, they were there. How come it hasn't gone off yet? How come it hasn't gone off? So this is what I'm thinking. Before I'm even approaching it, this is inside my mind. The six factors why an RCID hasn't gone off yet. And I'm sure there's more, but this is what I come down to. Either one, the target hasn't shown up. That's it. He's there, everything is good, and he's just waiting for the target to come up before he dials in the code. Pretty simple. Two, design. Did it put it together right? You failed Lego class. That's it, right? <laughs> there was a loose, le a loose wire or something like that. Hey, you can dial it in all day. It's not going to work. Sorry. Three is improper code. Everything's going smooth. He's not dialing the right number. Should have paid attention. Unfortunately, he didn't. Or, fortunately, he didn't. Uh, four, power. He doesn't have enough power to transmit that phone. Or, the receiver in the actual device itself, the thing that receives the code and functions the device, doesn't have enough power. It's dead. That could be one of them. Uh, all right. Uh, there are 24. And uh, what's my train of thought here? Five. He's not there. Everything's working well. He's not there. Six being electronic countermeasures are interfering with the signal. Everything's working well. But we carry electronic countermeasures, PCM, personal electronic countermeasures, and now they're interfering with that code. So he's, tra he's transmitting the signal, but we're blocking it. We're saying not happening today. So why hasn't this thing gone off yet? Why hasn't it gone off? And before a counter ID operator goes down on something, that's what he's thinking of. Why hasn't this thing gone off yet? Who is the target? How is this thing going to get set off? What's going on? Anyway. This particular incident, I was thinking, if it is an IED, because I didn't know yet, it was reported as a potential observation post. You'll see why in a minute. Didn't know yet. If it is, the target's probably me. That's what I was thinking. Because he had a lot of guys he could have chose from. But he's waiting out. Who's he waiting for? It's either me or the team when they come down at the end. It could have been worn off from Mike Miller. He comes down and takes a bunch of pictures. Who knows? It's probably one of us. 
Next slide, please. Getting into it. Story time. I approach the base of the tree. Looking up, it's called a mulberry bush. Not very much of a bush. It's about 13 feet tall, as thick as anything, as thick as wood. So I attempt to climb the tree. I'm standing there looking, thinking, it might be an observation post. It very well could be. I can't see anything right now. All I see is a bit of that paint, tiny bit, bunch of hair. I attempt to climb, can't do it. Can't climb, not due to lack of physical ability, it's because it was too thick and I was wearing too much gear. I climbed down about this high, that's how high I got. Take off my gear, try again. Finally get up to about head height with this pile, big pile of hay and this pink structure. I'm not too sure where it is. I'm thinking it's a cushion for your butt so I can sit there and watch. It's not. So as I start to move the hay, I see a little piece of deck cord and I thought, hey, this is good. <laughs> it hasn't gone off yet. <clears throat> Why is it? Things are good. Things are good. Take out the knife, go up, attack the explosive train. Cut some deck cord. Now, explosive train is if you attack it, those you don't know, it's very much a, a sequence of events to initiate something. If you take one thing out, kind of like a recipe, it's not going to have the desired result. In this case, it won't go off. Attack the explosive train. That's what I did. Now I'm thinking, evidence. Got to get some evidence. There's no point in going down and blowing everything up. What's the point of that? Nothing, right? You got to treat evidence. You got to try and get something to put the guys who put it there away. Now it could be something as simple as the type of wire they're used that's only available in a certain part of maybe Iran. So now we're establishing some supply chains. Or it could be fingerprints on the tape. That's why we're there. Get some evidence. So hey, time for some evidence. Figure. Move around, dig, dig, dig. Wasn't able to come across any, anything I wanted to move or cut. Right? Now you have to imagine, it's kind of looking at you through this right here. If you do that with your hands, that's kind of what I see. So, hey, I got a camera in my pocket. Let's do this. You got the camera, put it over the top of my head, snap a picture, look at it. Hey, next slide, please. This is what I see. I got a receiver. Original location, I got a power source, I got a battery. Good stuff. Now, uh, no one's HC qualified in the audience. You're an HC, sir? Okay. We'll talk about procedures later on. <laughs> so I was thinking that I'm probably not going to experience the first collapsing circuit, IED, within PBSG area at that very moment. So collapsing circuit is if you disconnect the power it actually functions the device. A right? little bit of a gamble there, a little bit more of a risk. I thought, hey, this is fun. You know what? Power source, you're coming up. So I look at the camera, figure with my hand, dig, 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 dig. That's probably where the power source is. I'm doing this, but it's more something contorted around the aid of like, like this, right? Take out the power source. Hey, good. Pocket. Receiver. Pocket. Okay. Well, while I'm here, might as well grab the main charge, right? Might as well grab the detonator, might as well grab the main charge. Hasn't gone off yet. It's not going to go off. Things are good. Good day. Rustle down the main charge. Unfortunately, it falls down. Anyway, <laughs> it's caught up a bunch of times within the tree, right? Well, I got some good evidence. Things are good. Next slide, please. There's the main charge there. Approximately 15 uh, kilograms of HME or homemade explosives laden with uh, shrapnel, uh, one-inch ball bearings, bolts, nuts, Little projectiles, 5.56762 caliber. Uh, that's just my CA rifle, but collapsed, so it's approximately this big, like a uh, an office garbage can, right? Uh, next slide, please. That's the original device composition. So you see that the power source top right, the battery will be connected to the leads on the receiver. Receiver right here, bottom left. That's uh, the detonator, right? They initiate the, the explosive train. It's all taped up, and it'll be taped up to the deck port, which you see on the bottom right. You see uh, in blue where it says entering the main charge. That's what would actually make the main charge go off, right? It's this whole sequence, the whole recipe that's talking to you about. What's great about this is these bottom left improvised detonators, 
They give off a ton of evidence. Tape gives off a ton of evidence, right? Good stuff. I mentioned earlier the code. The code, maybe it's on the wrong code. So if you look at the receiver top left, you see some numbers written there. That's actually the code. I know it's covered by some tape or, or uh, another form of material, but that's the code. So next slide, please. All right, getting back to mentality psychology. I wasn't walking down that particular call thinking, yay, this is going to be fun, but it's always fun, right? Risk? Yeah, there's a bunch of risk in that one. Definitely. Uh, luck? I don't know why. I don't know why the, the device wasn't functioning. I have no idea to this day. All I know is it didn't function. Didn't you, you might want to call it luck. Who knows? Faith. Here's an interesting part. So PCM. First one, electronic counterman. What happened was the, the ECM operator, ECM tech in the team had determined previously that we probably didn't have the best coverage. Probably didn't have the best coverage against that specific type of receiver. Right? So beforehand, by going down, he said, hey, I want you to place it here or here or here, as we do, right? 100% follow that plan to a T. He knows what he's doing, follow his plan. You wouldn't use a shovel to hammer in a nail. Right? If you have the proper tool, use it. He knows. 100% faith in his decision. If he's wrong, it could very well result in a, a bad day for me. So intellectual simulation, guaranteed. What we always used to do is sit down as a team and find out what happened. Why was it there? We don't know. A lot of times the question is, we don't know why. We can always assume that we don't know. All that made up for a good day. I remember distinctly walking back to the ICP saying, that was some crazy blank, right? Good times. Okay, carry on. How are we doing for time? My about 10 minutes? All right. Here's another really good one. This is out of Kandahar City, just south. So, any compound you see on the southern side, which is the top part of the slide, you see a large wheat field that will come into play later. You see that serpentine band, blue purplish band, that's called root lake effect. Uh, the gas station there, blue and green. And then you see the dotted arrow coming up south hard right into the enemy compound. Call sign outlaw, 97 MP platoon out of the United States. Get where are the United States? What had happened was that warrant officer Mike Miller, I was talking about earlier on, came knocking on my door approximately 0, 0300 hours. Talks like this Hey, the ratchet voice. Hey, Jeff, get up. Got something I need you to see. Okay, sounds good. I get up, go over, and I'm watching. I'm watching these individuals bury an IED right there. I'm watching them via. We have these, uh, I always call them nocturnal aerial surveillance. That's not what they're called. Uh, the big blimps with a bunch of cameras on. Perfect surveillance. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so we're watching these guys at night. Very an ID. Hey, this is great. And then we watch them go through the wheat field, back into the compound. And Mike looks at me and says, let's go get these guys. Said, You're on to something, buddy. Let's do this, right? So we go knocking on uh, 97 MP platoon's door and we say, hey, we need some help. Give me a couple of vehicles, right? He says, okay, sounds good. What we're going to do is, we're going to approach from the north, going south. We're going to get to the gas station. This is all ad hoc. This is all, right now it's 2.30 in the morning. We're just going to VPS, vulnerable point search. We're going to get out, pretend like we don't even know the IEDs there. We haven't seen nothing. Simultaneously, call sign outlaw, 97 MP platoon. They're going to double time it. They're going to double time it to the south, hard right around the wheat field, and go and get those guys in the compound before they even know we should them. Good enough. Let's do it. Sounds good. Mount up. We get there. We start doing it. And it's smooth. Things are happening. We're VPSing. We don't know the ID. It's there. We don't know what type of it is. We know it's there. We don't know what type of it is. Call sign outlaw. It's going south, hard right around the wheat field. So far, so good. Next slide. So there's a wheat field there. You see the uh, call sign outlaws vehicles. They're approaching the compound. If you look to the left of the slide, 
there's a, a structure there. And what that is is a telephone pole. And they would use that as an aiming marker, much like uh, your front sight post on, on, a, on a weapon, on a gun. So from their compound, if they put that IED at the base or near, in line with the line of vision, that uh, telephone pole, they can use it as a sight. When the vehicle goes across the telephone pole, you function the device, there you go. Makes sense. Next slide. One thing we didn't take into consideration is traffic. We showed up, and there's a bunch of traffic there. Okay, so now we've got to deal with that. What do we do? We know there's an ID there, and you'll see later on that guy in the white, he's pretty much walking on top of it right now. Okay, let's get rid of the traffic, tell them to come on through, search them, or set them off. Next slide. Ends up, they about turn, head to the south. So here you see our ROV. By this time, unbeknownst to ourselves, because communication was not as, as clear as it should be, or I shouldn't say should be, could be, between call sign outlaw and ourselves, we didn't know how things were going in the compound. We didn't hear any gunfire. Things are probably smooth. Maybe they're not there. Or maybe they got them and they're just really happy about it and want to wait to tell us because it's going to be a surprise. So we deploy our ROV, go looking for this thing. We know it's there because we saw. We saw them put it in. And you see around bed number two over there, you see some of our Canadian forces for the security. All right. Unfortunately, this ROV isn't finding nothing. Ian Kennedy, Sergeant Ian Kennedy's on there. He's saying, Jeff, I'm not finding nothing. I'm saying, what do you mean you're not finding nothing? You saw him put it in. It's right there. Go find it. He said, I'm not finding nothing. What do you want me to do? I said, I'll hop in there. I'll find it. No. I'm not finding nothing. A bunch of apologies in the suit, right? Sorry, Ian. Sorry for doubting you. Anyway. Next slide, please. This is what happens. Throw in the suit because the vehicle is there. Go down. Remember before I mentioned the electronic countermeasures, personal electronic countermeasures? So just to the right with myself in that picture. So I started skirting around, skirting around, looking for it, looking for it, looking for it, from big to small, right? Where is this thing? Can't find it. Can't find it. Can't find it. You see in my hand, there's a mine detector there, or I shouldn't say a mine detector, it's a metal detector, specializing, I guess it was specialized depending on who was using it. Um, can't find nothing. Not picking up a hit, not getting anything. So. Remember the earlier call I mentioned in the tree? We always wondered why it hasn't gone off yet. What's the influence? Who's the target? Right there, I don't know what's going on. I know there's an ID here. I know there's an ID. I watched them put it in. What's going on? And then I saw people walk over it. So it's probably not going to be victim operated. You're probably not going to put pressure on it or influence it in some physical way to make it function, right? So what is going on? Kind of baffled, but you got a job to do, check it out. Standing there, just sitting in my hand, that's actually taken about maybe a half second afterwards from the uh, cab, from the interior of the vehicle. Don't know what's going on. It, it makes an audible sound, right? Audible beeps. So don't know what's going on, don't know what's going on. Looking for this thing. Can't see any influence of dirt or anything. Baffled. <coughs> Finally, getting a little hit. Hey, things are good. Little hit. Things are good. Unfortunately, that little hit's going under my foot. It's under my left foot. What's going on there? Is it my boot setting it up, right? So I move my left boot, check it out, and there's a little hit. And this is what I saw. Next slide. This is what we got. Antennas on a small twig. So imagine if you will. The twig's about, if you look at it down at your pinky finger, half the diameter of your pinky finger, and just as long. It's wrapped around and it's sticking just under the rope. Now it's covered in dust, so you can't tell it's an antenna. But it's enough to set off the mine attack. That's what was picking up. Hey, good piece of gear. So I noticed that. I was actually stepping on the bottom half of it. Remember that luck part I mentioned before? <laughs> stepping on the bottom half of it. Right, so uh, in the report, I think it says, uh, the counter ID operator noticed an antenna and expediently returned to the ICP. What that means is, I had an unexpected bowel movement, <laughs> and ran back to the ICP, right? Not literally. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so now we know where it is. Let's send down the ROV to go get it. Excellent. Guess what? The ROV can't dig. 
because the ground's too hard. Lucky day. So we employ what we call a, what we call an explosive digging charge. It doesn't exist in this case. All it did was just picked up some dirt, right? Okay. So then there was talk again. Why are we here? What's going on? Why don't we just blow it up? Well, because you're not going to get any evidence, that's why. And we already got these guys. We, know, we learned by then that those guys are captured. Hey, good day. Why don't we send them packing with what they put in the ground? Here you go, folks. Right? That's what. So we turn it down, dig a little bit, hopefully get some hook and line. Now, for those of you who don't know what hook and line is, it's a semi-remote means of influencing something. So literally just a long string with maybe another string attached to it, another loop or another tool. You can attach to something, move a chair, close a door, take something out of the ground. That's what's in my hand right there. Hook and lock. That's what we're doing. Next slide. Worked beautifully. Pull the whole thing out from under the rope. Next slide. All right. So what the ID was, another RCID. Good time. That's a view from the, R the RCID hole. These guys are smart. They dug it underneath. Underneath the, uh, the road itself. The only thing that was protruding from the road was the little antenna. Right? These guys know what they're doing. Let's view back at what we call the ICP, which you know uh, what it is, right? And that's our vehicle, the cooler. Next slide, please. So that's the device itself. You have two main charges there, or what would comprise of the main charge. About five gallon panels themselves full of HME, homemade explosives. Uh, this charge itself is designed for, we presume, a vehicle. Now we learned that there's a bunch of supply runs that were being regularly run along the lake, lake effect by coalition forces, so undoubtedly tar uh, targeting one of them. Again, the receiver, the RFT2 receiver, that gray box, you see on the numbers on it, there's a code. Very, very similar to the previous incident, right? Very similar design. Bigger charge. Next slide, please. Those guys are having a bad day. <laughs> we were fortunate enough to catch them on uh, video, record it, right? Then we were fortunate enough to grab the device that they implanted, this stuff, in its entirety minus the main charge. We just got rid of the contents of the HM. So everything else is there. Fingerprints all over it. Fingerprints plus video plus the guys. Pretty much put them in a package and send them off, right? Next slide, please. Uh, that video, or that picture wasn't taken by myself, but here they are. Uh, it was taken by a member of the team. I'm not going to mention who. That's the fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? That's the fun. Uh, I guess he said something to the effect of, you guys should have stayed in the school. And then, in perfect English, he said, maybe you should have as, as well, right? <laughs> He's like, yeah, maybe I'll shut my mouth next time. <laughs> yeah, maybe you will. Next slide. That's what we got. So these guys weren't engaging in any type of electrical work. They didn't have an electrical company. They weren't installing conduit on the weekends, right? But they had a lot of wire for some reason. They had no means of running it, no generator. So what were they doing with that wire, right? You see a microscope up on top there. Um, they had all the ability to make HME, to make some high-potency stuff, make some really good stuff. They didn't find any in the compound. That doesn't mean they didn't make any for their device. Uh, they probably weren't engaging in grade five science experiments, right? Probably didn't happen. Uh, the arms on the, on the bottom left, those aren't anything significant. Almost every Afghan has an AK anyway. Uh, so that's probably just for personal protection, right? Next slide, please. Here we go. So the mentality going down. I can honestly say that was one of the most fun times uh, of my life, let alone career. To be able to be engaged in such an ad hoc operation. Hey, you want to try this? Yeah, let's try it. And have the assets and resources to be able to do it. And then to have that operation be successful, that's fun. That's, that's fun. I don't know. That's fun. Risk. Yes, there were some risks involved. The commanders of the camp were willing to absorb that risk and give us those assets to do it. Good on that. The risk is always there for the operators, but that's all good. That's just fun. A bit of luck, I'm not quite so sure there was luck. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some unluck in this situation for them, right? But 
Faith always applies. Always, always, always applies. In this case, the, uh, the ECM uh, technician of the team, Masco from Dale Jansen, said, you know what, you're not getting coverage, let's move closer with the vehicle. We did. Insert saturation on the area, right? You just got to heed their, their, their word, and that's it. And obviously, sitting down afterwards and talking about the entire situation with the call, call sign outlaw, 97 and, and people too, with ourselves sitting back and at the end of the day and saying, you know what, that was a job well done, guys. Like, we got everything. What else do you want to do? What else do you want to do? We got absolutely everything. Except for, of course, the supply chain, right? The monetary system. So that's, that's out of our league. So that was incredibly intellectually stimulating. Now, I'm not ignorant to the fact that these individuals probably went to jail for maybe a month and later on broke out. Right. Cat and mouse, right? Cat and mouse. That's all it is. What can you do? Next slide. Here's a little quote I found. I was researching a little bit, but what makes this fun? Why the risk, right? The adventure of gambles with life to heighten sensation to make it glow for a moment, right? To make life glow for a moment. That's exactly what I think occurred on a regular basis, on each and every call. So as to the why, I could never give my presentation of these two calls to my wife because she'd probably fall asleep in five minutes, <laughs> right? But I, what I can do is say, hey, take a look at this quote, check it out. And she can agree, somewhat, to some extent. At least you can understand the why of why we do this. Folks, well, that was, or those were the two calls that I had the most fun on, without a doubt, in my experience from April to December of 2010. As a counter ID operator as part of the Task Force 110. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you ever worry about getting overconfident and having to, you know, these ones, you're initially very tense and you're tight and you're, you're all focused. Is there a danger over time that you become a little blase, a little too confident, and then you have to do something to keep your edge up? Uh, 100%. 100%. Uh, you don't really have to do anything to keep your edge up. Fortunately, incidents happen that do it for you, right? You might make a little mistake, we're humans. It could be something where that luck factor comes in. You're thinking, for instance, <laughs> myself, I was digging on a uh, VOID, a victim operator. So if you influence it, and this one was pressure. You step on it, apply pressure, go off. I'm a ballistic eyewear, protective uh, eyewear. And there's a strap that goes behind the eyewear. Nobody wears a strap. In fact, I think we call it the loser strap. <laughs> right? So it's hot. I bent over. I'm all four. So I'm digging on this thing. And then guess what happens? My eyewear slides off my face. <laughs> Nearly misses the pressure plate. Right? So you're thinking, I'm going to wear that loser strap. But to this day, I wear that loser strap <laughs> because of that. And usually when I tell an individual that story, they start wearing a loser strap. So yeah, usually it happens for us, to answer the question. Usually it happens for us. Jeff, did you find you had all the equipment you required to do that job? Or were you, would you like to have some other stuff? All the equipment in Densa. The ROV that we had was uh, excellent. What we had to this day, Tito, excellent. Excellent ROV. We worked uh, side by side with the American team in uh, Kenhar City. And uh, ROV far, far superior than this. Uh, in terms of the hook and line, hook and line resulted from a bundle of 550 cord in your pocket, and usually uh, some uh, tubular nylon at the end. Maybe a pair of uh, vice grips. That's it. So in terms of equipment, absolutely. Yeah. Bomb suit itself, you're never going to get a bomb suit that responds to everybody's need. You're not, it's not going to happen. It doesn't provide mobility. The, the conditioning system doesn't work, or you're not going to use it, or it gets clogged up, or it takes too long to maintain. So, so is that lead-edge equipment you were wearing? It, it is. It is, yes. yes. Uh, good equipment. Uh, like I said, I'm a positive guy, easy to please. May not be the best critic for it. But in my opinion, yes, you know, I could. Thank you. Sir. What trades were involved in those teams other than combat engineers? Excellent. So we had uh, Navy, Air Force, uh, Army. We had uh, clearance divers from the, the Navy, right? Uh, P.O. Blake, uh, KIA uh, in May, I May 3rd. Uh, he was another operator from their team, from Navy 3, I believe. Uh, his partner was uh, Dunny, uh, Chris, just got, unfortunately, very disfigured from uh, the same incident, right? So he was Air Force, and then we had, there's no ammo attacks, no ammo attacks from, from any, uh, any element whatsoever, and uh, Army, 
definitely earned. Any other questions? Did you see the movie Hurt Locker? What you think of it? Right. Uh, it was entertaining. Right? That's all it was, entertainment. Right? It wasn't a documentary of any sort. It's, it's entertainment. Did you relate to it? Uh, sometimes, yes. For that uh, one particular incident, incident, one particular moment in the movie where he's talking to his wife and saying, you know, they're short for operators overseas. Mm -hmm. Right? He's addicted. That's all it is. He wants to go. He wants to have some fun. Right then I was like, man, I know what you're saying. And the wife says, no. <laughs> so you have a question? What you gave your MSM for, sir? Uh, the MSM was given for uh, courage and uh, leadership in the counter ID role as an operator throughout uh, that time, sir. Doing my job. That's all I got, of course. Actually, I sit on that committee. But oh, did you? And actually, the people yeah, who make it to that committee <laughs> are just. Appreciate it, so thanks a lot. Any other questions? Thanks a lot for your oh. hope. Just a comment. Sure. Over the years, many people uh, that have been to work with you uh, have given you those vehicles, uh, made the plan for the approvals to get those. Uh, and uh, as, uh, if the minister wishes, soon uh, you will approve facilities for the UAE and the UAE facilities in the Asia. Excellent. That's good news. First I hear it. It's fantastic. That's good news right there. Is it even a question? I love it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, thanks a lot for your time and your ears this evening. It's been a pleasure.